Okay, hello and welcome everyone. Um, welcome to Engineers Ireland, uh, Ireland's latest graduate and student webinar. Um, today's talk will be recorded and we're asking you to uh, please don't forget to mute your microphone. Um, today's talk is part of um, a wider series uh, where we have many webinars exploring different aspects of career or uh, labour market insights um, and uh, you can check them all out on our YouTube channel. Um, as well for people who are joining us on a recording on our YouTube channel, uh, if you want to join as a student member for free or if you want to apply for a graduate transfer, the link is in the description below. Um, you can take advantage of your graduate uh, transfer in your year of graduation and this will save you 700 euro during your first four years. Um, as we as a professional body, we are invested in your long-term professional uh, development. Um, you can do this on your membership profile. You just log in and you uh, click the option to become a full member, which will become available to you once you're in your graduation year. Uh, and just to flag that this offer to our 2020 graduates ends soon. So email me on mgallagher at engineersireland.e if you want to apply before the deadline because your time is running out. So for today's talk, uh, we're delighted to welcome Ronan McGovern. Uh, Ronan is a mechanical engineer who grew up in Newbridge, County Kildare and studied at UCD. At the age of 21, he got a scholarship to go to MIT where he learned about membrane filtra filtration technology and seawater desalination. After graduating in 2014, he started Sandiment Technologies, a technology platform allowing uh, brewers to remove water from beer and to make a concentrate and then add water back either at the bar, at home or at a bottling plant. In late 2019, he started Point Five Brewing, a non-alcoholic lager brand that is sold online in the US. As a brief interlude during the onset of COVID-19 in 2020, he started a hand sanitizer business with proceeds going to charities supporting low-income families in the US. Uh, we're presenting Run-On in conversation with in fireside chat format with Lisa Vaughan. Lisa is Engineers Ireland um, Director of Membership and Business Development. She's also an executive coach. She's previously worked with Enterprise Ireland where she's Director of Startups and Scaling Companies. And she's also previously worked for Pfizer in New York. Lisa is a chartered director and is a, is a director of Board Ishkamara, uh, which is Ireland's seafood development agency. She also chairs, or she has also chaired the board uh, of Dress for Success, a non-profit organisation assisting people returning to the workforce. So, Lisa, I guess I'd like to hand it over to you um, as we enter our fireside form format. Thanks, Michal, and uh, welcome everybody today. And welcome, Ronan. It's delighted, delighted to have you here, and uh, welcome home. I uh, believe you've made it back onto to home soil for uh, the foreseeable, which is great to hear. We love to see uh, Irish entrepreneurs coming back uh, to Ireland. I suppose, Ronan, you've had, um, uh, obviously, you've been to UCD and MIT. Um, and I'm just curious to start off, um, was entrepreneurship something that you were always interested in? Or is that an interest that kind of developed when you went to MIT? Just curious as to uh, how that started for you. Um. I suppose I would have had a curiosity just in general as a kid, but um, I thought I would be an academic. I thought I'd be a professor. Um, so that's what I thought when I was at uh, UCD. And that's what I thought when I went over to MIT. It was only at MIT when I saw other people, you know, filing patents and starting companies that I thought about maybe doing a startup. And, and when you, I suppose, when you got there and, and you saw that, did you, were you able to kind of lean on people within the campus at MIT for advice and and guidance as to you know the first steps into entrepreneurship? Um, I think the biggest factor is just seeing other students uh, or colleagues around you doing it for themselves. That's probably a much bigger motivator than any infrastructure you could put around. Although there is quite a bit of infrastructure there on the MIT side in terms of classes and mentoring services. Oh yeah, and so in your in in your discipline in MIT, um, you were able to get access to business modules or credits. Were you? Was that part of of the training for you? Um, you can, yeah, you can do some entrepreneurship classes. I didn't do any myself particularly, so it's more something I did, you know, extracurricular. And uh, when I finished my PhD, I started working part time as a postdoc. And I used that kind of as a vehicle to keep a little bit of income coming in, keep my visa in place while I was doing the groundwork for starting the business. Okay. So when, when we take ourselves back to when you started the business, maybe just talk us through your experience of those first six or eight months of starting your own company and 
what that was like for you and maybe on reflection, what are the things that you might uh, have done differently or what lessons have you taken with you to the other companies? So, uh, you know, 2014, I was finishing my PhD and I uh, felt very overwhelmed between trying to get my thesis together and also find a job for when I graduate. And I got to a point where it was kind of too much and I said, oh, I'm not going to, I'm going to give up on looking for the job and I'm going to focus on finishing my thesis. Now, at that time, I had a small parallel project to commercialize a, a desalination patent that I had put together. Um, but I decided, okay, I'll focus on my thesis. And so when I got to the end of my PhD in June 2020, 2014, um, I didn't have a job. Uh, <laughs> so um, I said, well... A good motivator. <laughs> Yeah, so I said, well, you know, I've been doing this kind of commercialization uh, a bit on the side, so maybe this is a good opportunity coming off um, the PhD to try and do a startup. And my advisor was supportive and gave me a postdoc so I could keep my visa, as I said. Um, so I said, you know, I, I'll take a three-month postdoc here, and um, by that time I'll have raised money and um, I'll be off then running the startup. So. Got to the end of the three months and uh, was nowhere close to uh, having any money raised or having like a clear market. And I said, oh, you know, I'll extend this now. Um, I'll extend it until the end of the year. So I did that. Got to the end of the year, still wasn't ready. Um, I extended by another six months, extended it by six months into June, 27, uh, June 2015. And I got into an accelerator then at MIT. So I did an accelerator in 2015. I had, um, I had a co-founder at that time who's still a good friend of mine, although he's not involved. Uh, this is Sandy Mount, the beer, um, the beer concentrate business. Yeah. Um, so went through that accelerator, said, you know, coming off the accelerator, perfect. I'll just raise some money off this accelerator here. Great opportunity. And I'll be away in a hack. Um, finished the accelerator and um, one or two of my key customers pulled out of what I thought would be big deals. Um, and my co-founder decided it wasn't for him to do a startup. So yeah. ended up having to extend until the end of the year on my postdoc. Um, found two new co-founders. And then finally, things started to look like they'd come together. I had two new co-founders. I got a small grant in Massachusetts, 40,000. Um, and then in the new year in 2016, I finally did manage to pull together um, uh, an initial round of funding. And then I actually launched. So you can see that, and I don't think this is a typical, um, what I thought would be three months ended up being more like two years in order to get the first funding in. Absolutely. I, I think, uh, uh, but it does take, take resilience and perseverance, I think, to get there. Maybe if you come back to the beginning, uh, going into the accelerator, because I think for a lot of, um, you know, young engineering students and maybe graduates thinking about a, a leap into startups, it's the, it's the path in now is to maybe try to get into an accelerator. How did you approach the pitch and, um, you know, how did you find that experience or get the best out of the experience within the accelerator? Um. How did I approach the pitch? Um, well, I'll just give you the specifics. So at MIT, the thing they love focusing on is customer interviews. So they're big fans of getting you to go out and interview mm. customers. Um, and mm. that's kind of like a big emphasis. Now, I kind, of had, I kind of had gotten the gist of that before I did the accelerator. So to some degree, when I was in the accelerator, it was a bit of repeat and I'd already done quite a lot of the interviewing. Um, you know, there's, there's some kind of, I suppose, badger signaling you get from being in an accelerator that probably does, uh, that probably does help out. Um, I think on the other hand, an accelerator is, it was three months. Um, and when you're in a, in a business like hardware with a long sales cycle that can take, you know, multiple years, um, you know, you're just not going to be able to do in three months what people do in software, maybe at Y Combinator or something like that. Mm. So you have to bear that mm. in mind as well. Um, mm. In terms of like the pitch, yeah, I mean, I don't know. People like talking about pitches. I don't think pitches really matter. Like the pitch doesn't really matter what you do. <laughs> I think <clears throat> the most important thing is like having a product that you're genuinely interested in and having, you know, a team of people um, that, you know, are committed to the project and ideally, thirdly, having like customers or some form of traction in the, you know, form of users or paying customers. Yeah. So I think like at the end of the day, like people talk about pitch decks, it doesn't really matter what's in your pitch deck. Uh, is my opinion. Yeah, no, no, and I think that's an interesting point. And I suppose um, what I'm, where I'm coming from is when, when you're a technical founder, and I, I would consider you, maybe you, you, you might describe me as a technical founder um, with, with the, the IP behind the product, sometimes right. the, the, it, the 
a lot of the focus is on the technical aspects of the product and, and not necessarily encompassing that market either engagement or attraction, depending on where you're at. And I suppose just from a technical perspective, it's probably good to have both of both sides of that in, in your in your early stage to, to deliver some confidence to the people at the other side of the table. Would you agree or disagree? Um, I don't know if what you're getting at is that as like an engineer, um, you, you tend to ignore the business or the distribution or the sales side easily. And so you have to be very conscious of focusing on that. So... I think if you split it by a B2B business where you're selling to large customers like uh, Sandy Mount does sell to brewers um, and then split it into, you know, a B2C where you're selling product to customers like 0.5 non-alcoholic beer. Um, I think for B2B business, you, you definitely need to spend a ton of time talking to the customers and ideally getting commitments from them and making a ton of phone calls. And then on the B2B side, which to be honest, I'm really just learning about, um, I think you have to think very hard about um, distribution, sales channels, um, um yeah so i mean yeah if you're saying that technical people don't focus enough on on uh, the sales side then yes that was me yeah no no and, and 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 that that you know everybody has to bring different strengths to it and it's it's i suppose that brings me on to my next question which is um we see a lot of engineering students and engineering employers they they look they they see engineering as a discipline as a team sport so you can't achieve anything really without a broad team very similar to a, a startup so you spoke about you know um getting two new co-founders partially through the process what skill sets and what did you look for in the co-founders and that that what did you feel was important to bring to to your skill set um so so I think there's a lot of emphasis in entrepreneurship on like building up the right team. And I think while there's merit to that, because getting people committed shows that, you know, there's something maybe there in terms of value in the company. I think there can be overemphasis in building a team that's maybe, you know, diverse in terms of skill set. Um, I think that it's a very personal thing. So I can just talk about me. So I see myself as somebody who's very technical. But I also um, see myself as somebody who enjoys doing the business aspects. Um, and I think it can be tempting to try and outsource, um, you know, parts because there's a natural feel, oh, you know, I should have a CTO. And so that's what I did. I went out and I hired a CTO. And in the end, that was a bad decision because I ultimately knew the technology best and I should. Which okay. Is what I'm doing now that's not to say I don't need any technical help and um you know one of my good friends um he became like director of engineering and on an operational basis he's a lot more operational kind of than technology strategy but we kind of formed a very strong partnership there because he was able to do kind of a lot of the hands-on and a lot of the project management and that is a high bandwidth thing and um, so yeah I would caution against thing is people will add in an MBA, you know, build out the business side of our, mm -hmm. of our startup. Um, I'm pretty against that. I think that um, founders should be encouraged to try and do the business aspects themselves. Um, now, not every technical founder will want to do that. And so you, you need to figure out for yourself, um, are you somebody that wants to be purely technical, which is totally fine um, and needs mm -hmm. to have a business co-founder, or are you, you know, purely business and need a technical, or can you do both? Um, mm -hmm. So, here are my comments on team. <laughs> what about um, culture and building a culture within your, your, your organization? Is that something that you've explicitly thought about or do you just, does it just evolve as, as you, you're working together? Um, so, I think it's a lot more important as you get bigger and the businesses that I've run so far, I've, we've never had more than, you know, about a dozen people. Um, it does start to become more, you know, prominent when you've a dozen. Um, but I think the answer is to, to try and do things um, personally as far as possible. What I mean by that is a specific example is I would interview absolutely everybody that we would hire. Um, so I think you try and avoid like having multiple tiers for as long as possible. Um, and I don't think I've ever gotten to the stage where I've had to had, you know, a lot of tiers in the organization, basically everybody more or less reports to me, maybe there's some interns or something. Um, 
So I think you try and do that and that will eliminate the need for having systems. Now that will only scale so far and I don't think I have the experience to say, you know, what you would do a lot beyond that. And can I ask you, in, in your engagement with customers, um, did that lead you to iterate or change your, your product or processes in any way? And how did that, you know, just maybe talk about that a little bit. Um, well, the biggest iteration I'd say was just picking the vertical. So what I have is it's a membrane filtration technology um, that allows you to concentrate liquids amongst, you know, other applications. And um, I kept a pretty broad mindset at the start as to what industry or application I would do. Uh, so I talk to people in oil and gas about wastewater treatment. I talk to people in fruit juice about concentrating in a way to better preserve flavor. And um, I talk to um, people in ethanol production. I talk to people then in brewing. And, uh, you know, for a long time, not a long time, but for about a year, I was actually working more in the oil and gas direction because fracking was getting big in the U.S. and there was a big problem with wastewater. Um, mm -hmm. And then oil, oil prices tanked in 2014. Um, and to be honest, there was a lot of competition as well with other technologies. Um, and that was when I pivoted during that summer to going into breweries. Um, so it definitely was through doing extensive, you know, interviews that we, you know, I changed the direction of where we were going. I would say like for Sandy Mount, our product hasn't really changed since the start. Like it's a, it's a machine that removes water from beer to make a high quality concentrated liquid that can be reconstituted at the bar um, or in a bottling plant. That really hasn't changed, Lisa, um, too much. I mean, there's obviously some technical things like around, mm. you know, you need a valve here for a safety shut off, but there's not been massive difference in, in the original view. Um, yeah, because uh, in fairness to you, Roland, like it, it, uh, for a lot of founders, they, they probably haven't been able, haven't done maybe the range of vertical research that you did, some kind of just latch on to a vertical and you could be three years down before you realize it's the wrong vertical. So, I mean, that's, uh, I mean, I think very juiced and hats off to you for, for being um, neutral, I suppose, or, or, or maybe skeptical of the different verticals to make sure you, you got one that, that worked well for you as a business. Um, just then on, on that as well, I suppose you mentioned before that obviously a lot of the startups that, that you hear about and, and, and people know about are probably in the software space. You know, we don't have as many in the engineering space and, and, you know, what are the tips that you would give to people as they, they move from a proof of concept or a small, small product or process into, you know, scaling it up a little bit or even beginning to scale it up? What are the sort of tactics that you use to, to do that effectively? Um, so I would just emphasize your point there on, on software, which is, uh, I mean, the point there is if you're raising capital, you are competing with any other startup. <laughs> and that really means software. So if you expect to raise money, you're going to have to be competitive with software. Um, and that's a really high bar. Um, I think to start, if you don't think you can get a gross margin of like 60%, I would recommend <laughs> in your product, you should really consider whether you want to do this. <laughs> because ultimately, if you don't have high profit margins, it will become extremely expensive to, um, you know, to scale. Um, and it's mm. already, I mean, software's automatically got, you know, 99% margin gross. So, um, yeah, you got to have a really high gross margin. And I just be really careful about doing any vertical where there's not a massive margin in, in hardware if, if you need to raise capital. Um, the other thing is, um, I think, to compensate as well for the disadvantage against software, it's, it's probably a lot more important to have um, customer, ideally customer traction, customer agreements, contracts, um, commitments, revenue, ideally. Um, I think that's one way that you can make up. So the way that Sandy Mount, um, what made Sandy Mount, and honestly, I would say Sandy Mount's like, it's not epic um, compared to software businesses because it is still hardware. And I could get into some pros and cons of the Sandy Mount business, but um, it does have a high margin. So we're in food and beverage, which is a high margin industry. Um, the equipment can you know, earn pretty high gross margins, like, like I said, 60%. Um, just because it's so specialized because of the regulations and stuff. Um, we also did get very strong support from uh, big breweries who have a lot of money. So they're well-funded and they paid us, you know, a lot of revenue all along the way that was used to scale. So they're kind of the two pieces. And then thirdly, the IP, the fact that we have some patents to protect it. Those three things kind of made us somewhat competitive with, you know, software startups. 
Yeah, no, no, they're they're really critical points. I think, um, you know, if you, if you have if you're in a B two B and it's hardware, your customers have to have money themselves. You know, they have to they they have to be willing to pay, and I think that's that's really critical. Um, just in curiosity about your IP and your patents, were they developed with MIT, and and how was that process? Because I think for a lot of people within the the third level sector, and there may be tinkering with an idea or a, an innovation, you know, that that comes into play fairly quickly. Yeah, so um, Sanumount does license, uh, there's an exclusive license from MIT for like kind of a, uh, an, the original underlying patent that I filed at MIT as a postdoc. And then since then, Sanumount, we filed our own. Now, um, I would say that has been a positive for Sanumount. MIT is known as a very uh, friendly, supportive technology licensing office. They have reasonable terms for licensing. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the MIT brand is also a positive for any startup that's licensing. It probably serves as a deterrent as well from, um, you know, people who might want to infringe. So I think definitely a big positive was having some IP from MIT. However, I would say that's, you know, probably a very small handful of universities where that's the case, where there's a supportive technology licensing office with reasonable terms and with a very strong brand. Um, so my gut feel is that if it wasn't like MIT or something similar, you'd be better off to try and personally, you know, own the IP rather than be tied into a university where you might have like burdensome obligations and expenses and all that. Yeah, no, no, I, I think, um, you know, there, there, there is a, a national framework in Ireland just for any of the students that are maybe in Ireland that uh, give it called Knowledge Transfer Ireland. And there's an excellent portal that gives you a lot of uh, country specific advice in terms of IP. So, um, you know, it, it, it can seem very challenging, I think, if you haven't done it, but, but it does lead to um, a good, I suppose, value within your company that's protectable, doesn't it? Um, yeah, so I think that brings us to a point around if you're going to do a startup, like what is it that's protectable? And IP is definitely one thing. Um, you know, obviously for pharma, that's a huge reason why pharma is so lucrative eventually, although there's big upfront costs because of the IP in it. Um, in software, um, in software, your benefit there is that it's hugely scalable because you write the code once and you can, you know, get out there ahead of everyone and you've got marginal cost. Mm -hmm. You obviously don't have that with hardware. Um, so yeah, if you're in, if you're in hardware, you've got to think about, well, you know, where's my advantage coming from? And I think the only, the only, the only real moats you can think about are either it's software, some economies of scale, IP is another moat. Another moat is brand. So like, if you've got a really strong brand, it makes it hard for competitors, but like that's a, that doesn't, you don't have a brand if you're a startup because by definition you're new. So a brand is something you can only develop over a very long period of time. So I don't think a brand is ever enough for doing a high growth business. Did you, did you uh, encounter competitors at all? Um, so, I mean, mostly our competition is kind of status quo because putting, I'm talking about Sandy Mount here. Um, the status quo is people don't use beer concentrates. So you're trying to move people over to a new mindset of, okay, now you can have this much more compact form factor. It's going to be less energy um, to transport, less cost, less weight for people to lug around. You can, um, you can um, recreate it, you know, fresh at the bar. So this is a whole new mindset. So our main competition is status quo, which I think is hopefully the case for any startup, because if you have a competitor at the start, then you're probably not off to a good start. Um, that being said, there are some other technologies and, you know, I would like to think we have significant advantages over them, of course, um, that are out there doing some, you know, beer concentrates. Um, I think, yeah, you're always going to get competition inevitably, um, but broadly status quo is the biggest competition. Okay. Yeah. And, and I suppose food and beverage is a vertical. It's a lot of large, long-standing companies. So... There's a, there's, a, there's a long history of doing things in one way, um, which is similar for people considering, you know, banking and finance and very big, big established areas. Um, just curious then, in terms of fundraising, I know obviously you have raised money. Um, what would you say about that experience and what would your kind of tips or guidance for people, albeit understanding that you did that in the US? I think there, there's, there's consistency probably in, in how you might approach it. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest factor for, um, so let me first say that there's a, there's a, the first time you raise money is the hardest time to raise money because you've got the worst network and you don't have any track record. So um, it's never the same if you're raising another time um, afterwards. So let me talk specifically about raising the first time. Um, I think the biggest lever you have in uh, getting a good fundraise is uh, revenue and traction. So there's no substitute for having a good, you know, 
contractor paying customers. So like, it doesn't really matter. Um, if you've got really good customers, that's going to be your biggest factor. Um, I think the next, the next thing after that is going to be, um, you know, having a good team with a track record is going to help. Um, so they're kind of the two levers that are independent. So that's, they're the fundamentals. If you don't have those, then it's going to be really hard. Um, the next part is your network. So, um, the value at which you can raise will depend on like the typical value at which money is raised in that network. So if you, um, if you raise in an MIT network, you know, your starting valuation for the company is probably going to be about five, six, seven million. If you raise in Silicon Valley, your starting valuation is probably going to be about, you know, 10, 15 million. <laughs> if you raise in Ireland, I don't know that much, but it's probably a few million. Um, so, I mean, you basically need to get into the network of ideally highest value. So ideally move to San Francisco post COVID. <laughs> That's probably your first step. <laughs> Another option is uh, go to MIT. That's not very time efficient. You have to like buy, get in and then do a PhD. So that what I did is definitely not the most time efficient way to, you know, build a network. Um, you know, there's online networks now, which I would say are unproven, but maybe um, there's kind of an emergence of like an online community of angels if you get deep enough in Twitter and Reddit and Clubhouse. Um, so that's yet to be proven, but that might be an interesting one because it transcends geography. Um, mm. so, so yeah, I mean, in summary, I would say that, you know, revenue matters, team matters, and then network matters. And, you know, none of those are easy to get. And did you have to meet a lot of potential funders before you closed with your your round or how how wide did you have to go how many how many conversations did you have to have um so i think um as a first time raise um i wasted a ton of time like trying to pitch to people and ultimately the people who invested are the people who i had uh, connections with uh, from mit and then referred me on to other people who invested <laughs> so just randomly like pitching to people doesn't usually return anything um so I think there's this vision that you just go out there and you like you pitch your idea to everybody. And the reality is that um, the people who will invest are people where you get, you know, warm introductions. So, you know, I think as you get more experience, you just learn to avoid doing a lot of pitches that are probably not going to return anything and focus just on, you know, where you have those warm introductions, which are not easy to get. Yeah, I, no, they're not. But I think that's great advice because particularly in the Irish scene, you know, it is a small enough pool and we're naturally like that anyway as a society. So, you know, you, you should be probably building up that network and that getting to know people probably well, you know, well before you actually come out looking for, for funding at some point, I, I, I'd agree. And um, did, you, did you use advisors? Did you get advice when you were going for your funding round or how did you, how did you manage the, the more legal and financial aspects of it, shall we say? Um, so first, just on the networking thing. So I think you're absolutely yeah. right. You need to spend time building your network. Um, but I would also say that people talk a lot about, oh, you know, go out and build your network in kind of a nebulous way as though it's an, uh, you can just go out there and do it as an end in itself. I would just say like, there's no way to fake it. You have to, you have to have genuine interests um, in pursuing a network. You can't just go out and build a network. You have to actually be interested in like tag rugby and go and play tag rugby or, you know, be interested in, you know, membranes and go to membrane events. Um, so I don't think you can just, going out and arbitrarily trying to build a network is a waste of time because people will think that you're just a consultant or a fool or something. <laughs> so um, your question then was, um, sorry. In terms of, you know, me. when you were doing your fundraising, did you, um, you know, did you, did you, did you have an in-house CFO or did you have to outsource and get some, um, you know, specific advice in terms of putting a funding round together? Um, so, yeah, I mean, when you do a funding round, you do need to have legal counsel. Um, I think that you can get outsourced bookkeeping firms that will do any, you know, historical records and you could even get them to do like some financial projection. I think people spend way too much time doing financial projections um, and uh, they're not really useful <laughs> at all because they're not going to predict anything. Um, I think in terms of, um, I, I think like the best approach is actually just to learn about it yourself and go online. So you can look up Y Combinator. They have a standard template called a safe um, simple agreement for future equity. 
Um, they also have a template, I think, for a convertible note. Um, so I think if you're going to raise money the first time, you should probably use one of those templates and um, you should try and change as little as possible in those templates because you could spend tens of thousands on lawyers drafting stuff, but I think you're much better off. And I don't know what the standard is in Ireland for what's being used, but in the US, people would just use one of those agreements. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And I suppose where I'm coming from is, um, you know, your investors are people who are probably going to be with you for a while. So, you know, you, you want a, a bit like a, a good contract. It is a good contract. It has to be, it has to work for both parties. And, um, you know, you, people can be kind of really eager to get their money in, but getting it in in the right way and in a way that, that doesn't kind of damage the company further down is important Yeah, well, I say, I um, that's why I try and not reinvent the wheel and try and go with something standard. It'll save time and money. And mm. The documents that, you know, at least are used in the US, like the Y Combinator ones are pretty founder friendly. So ideally use those. <laughs> mm. Great advice. Absolutely. Fundamentally agree with you. Can I ask you just personally, I suppose, um, you know, entrepreneurship can be quite a risky world to live in. Um, what's your appetite for risk and how do you deal with risk taking? Um, well, I think, you know, I'm getting a bit jargony here, but, you know, some people would say uh, the goal of entrepreneurship is to reduce risk. So in some ways, uh, I, you know, I really don't like risk and my goal every day is to get rid of it. Um, all right, let's stop being vague. I think, um, you know, people just have different, and it depends on your phase in life. Like I have friends and they went and worked for McKinsey um, and then they decided later, which seems to me to be a totally different career choice to go and do a startup. And um, so I've seen everything. Um, you know, I think, um, I think it's just a personal thing on whether you enjoy doing business um, and, uh, I would just say like, um, you, you want to have a hedge. So I, I think it's totally legitimate to have a full-time job and to do something as a side gig. In fact, that might be one of the best ways to start. Um, I think it's legitimate to have, you know, um, a husband or a wife who has a great job and is paying the bills. I think it's legitimate to, um, you know, drive an, an Uber in the US or a taxi here, you know, a few hours a day and make some money and, and do this on the side. Um, I think that that's really important. I think just quitting your job and doing a startup is a terrible idea. Um, so I would definitely think about, okay, what's your baseline? Mine was a postdoc. And then, you know, hopefully it's a baseline that gives you some freedom in the day to, to do some, you know, startup-y stuff. Brilliant. No, because it, it, it is, you know, it is a question that comes up, particularly when people are, are have maybe a choice of a couple of jobs after graduating and um, are wondering, is now the time to jump? And, you know, but, but I think your point where actually you can do both in parallel for a period of time is, 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 really, is really good. Um, just in terms yeah. of, I suppose... Uh, I, I would just yeah. add, like, um, for me, it made sense to do it right after MIT because I felt like I had a unique opportunity just coming off the MIT launch pad to use the MIT brand and to be an MIT startup, whatever that means. Um, so that was kind of a specific reason, but I think it's, you know, not better or worse to go and get, you know, a high paying job where you can bank some money and then, you know, create some free time a few years down the road. Um, maybe with the benefit of also some industry insights or, you know, I think as well, like you can't force a startup idea. So it's very hard. It's kind of like, if you want something badly, like it's really hard to get it. <laughs> it's the classic, <laughs> it's the classic, you know, if you want someone to go out with you, then, you know, they probably won't be interested. Um, or if you want, if you want to start a startup, you're probably not going to get the idea. So sometimes I think you might just have to go and, and do a job or, you know, get some hobbies and figure out what a good idea will be. It's certainly a lot better to do that than to get deep into an idea that's not going to grow or not have the characteristics of profitability or, you know, customer interest in order to grow. Yeah, I, I love your focus on gross margin and profitability because, um, you know, they, they're really North Stars for, for, your, for a startup, I think, but they, they get missed sometimes. Yeah, well, particularly in hardware, it's just very unforgiving. In software, yeah. in software, I think it's a little bit different. Um, and I would just emphasize mm. for a first time founder, it's also more important to be, you know, to be profit and cash flow focused because um, you don't have just a reputation. If you're like a second time founder or you have a big track record, that's another thing. You can maybe go out and raise a pile of cash and people trust that, you know, someday you're going to get it profitable. But if you're doing it for the first time, I think you have to be conservative. 
So just uh, my last question, Ronan, and thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. Um, any kind of words of advice? And I, I know they've been peppered in through this for kind of final year students, masters, engineer, recent grads, um, you know, thinking about taking the plunge. Um, yeah, I mean, as I said, I would say don't quit your job. <laughs> um, you know, personally, I like, I think reading, I've learned a lot from reading um, from other entrepreneurs. I really like Peter Thiel. His book, Zero to One, I think is a really important, I think it's a really fundamental book about, about the philosophy of startups. Um, I think Nassim Taleb, with his book, Skin in the Game, his book, Anti-Fragile, I think they have a lot to say on business in general. Um, there's a marketing book by Rory Sutherland called Alchemy, I think is very interesting for consumer-focused um, products. He's a very interesting perspective on, on marketing and psychology. And then I'd also say, like, just online is growing. Twitter, it's valuable being on Twitter. There's people I follow there. Um, there's a lady, Cody Sanchez. Um, she's quite young. There's a guy, Naval. There's a guy, Balaji Srinivasan. So these are all people that are doing startups or businesses. And I think you can learn a lot from them as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I'd agree. I think there, there's, a, there's a wealth of great content out there and a, a wealth of practitioners as opposed to theorists, I think, which is great. And they're very willing and have been very open to share their experiences across, across a lot of different types of products and services, which, which is fantastic. So uh, I'm, I'm going to close the chat now. Um, I don't know if there's any questions or anything, Michal, from your side. Uh, doesn't seem to be any questions, but yeah, again, just to say a massive thank you to Ronan. That was a really incredible talk. Uh, so a big thank you from Engineers Ireland. Yep, sounds good. Yes, and, and we, we, um, we definitely will see more of you, I'd say, and, and uh, you know, we wish you every success with your startups, and we're absolutely delighted that you're back in Ireland and um, part of the community here, which is a great startup community, and I recommend for anybody thinking of doing a startup, um, you know, we're a small, small startup community, but a, a very supportive one, so um, we're delighted to have yeah, you back cheers, as part of it. Yeah, cheers, thanks, Michal.